there's a fascinating book called Addiction by Design mm. by Natasha Dow Scholl. She's an anthropologist. So she spent time, a lot of time in Las Vegas talking to compulsive gamblers and the gambling, well, the gaming industry, as they call it, is also free spirited. Yeah. Not, I mean, people will stand there at a slot machine for 10 or 12 hours at a stretch, urinate on themselves because it, they get into this zone. Yeah. It's a kind of complete fixation. And the, the, the designers of these slot machines very self-consciously talk about their goal as being to get the, the person to play to extinction. That's the term of art. Wow. So that means they have no more money left. And some of the same personnel involved in that industry were then involved in designing the social media apps. Yep. There's something called the Stanford Persuasive Design Laboratory, which is a kind of Orwellian sound. It is. Um, you always come up with these horrifying terms that seem to be sort of screaming Orwell at you. You, I want to focus on this anti-humanism because you, you had this rather beautiful essay in First Things. I'm going to quote you something that you wrote, which I think is, is maybe can, can get this further out. The four anti-humanisms you wrote, as I see it, are these. Human beings are stupid, we are obsolete, we are fragile, and we are hateful. Maybe you could unpack, first of all, the stupid stuff. Well, that's what we've just been talking about, right. the, the, the premise that human beings are very poor reasoners, and so we may as well just kind of create a a choice architecture that to, to steer them according to some social good as we of course, it's human beings doing that as well. Yeah. Right. So they exempt themselves right, from their of own course, premises. Of course. And well, that's, you know, you're Cass Sunstein. Yeah. <laughs> What's you do? <laughs> and I think that that sort of special pleading on behalf right. of the conditioners is, is typical and it's, it's crucial to What about to notice. humans being obsolete? How we, how, how yeah. does our culture, well, so one example is self-driving cars. So, you know, it's, there's, first thing to know is that there is very little consumer for demand for this. It's very much a top-down project. And the refrain is human beings are terrible drivers. In fact, we're actually pretty good at driving. And the, the prospect of driverless cars being able to do as well as human beings is actually quite dim. This is, this is just kind of coming to light in the last five years. The engineering challenge of getting driverless cars to share the road with human drivers, that's the big challenge. So in order to sort of make the world more hospitable to driverless cars, you essentially have to make it illegal for, for humans to drive their own cars. And all of this begins to look like an expensive solution to a non-problem. Um, but there's a kind of, uh, you know, halo of progress and inevitability that's always invoked. You know, this is, this is the way things must go. Because um, humans, as we have always been, have to be replaced because we are just yeah. not good enough at being human. Yeah. So that, I think that becomes a kind of, you know, well, it's hard to say. This is a genuine question for me, whether this is just a cynical kind of hype, mode of hype to sort of clear the, clear away resistance to the program, in this case, you know, making giving cities over to driverless cars, or is it a sincerely held kind of anthropology that thinks of human beings as the weak link in the system? And I think I live in Silicon Valley now, and there are people here who who genuinely believe that human beings are this kind of like joke that needs to be cleared away, you know, so that, that there is a real, well, the whole transhumanist thing, which is huge out here, is kind of the, the most crystalline uh, version of that. And by that, you mean, let's say someone could be, let's, instead of having a human being, you could have an AI version of a human being that could replicate their thoughts, whatever. They could also be eternal because they obviously don't die. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm thinking more of this fantasy that we're going to be able to upload our consciousness to the cloud and escape 
the limitations of the body and of mortality. The body, I think, in this worldview is, sh shows up as this kind of filthy, unfortunate set of limitations on the will. So there's a, a sort of hankering to escape anything that impinges upon the free will.